Hi, and welcome to Darkwood Brew, and happy Easter. Here, we're steeped in ancient, mystical Christian practices. We bring all of that to you on the internet using the latest technology. As our usual host and Darkwood Brew executive director and spiritual leader, Eric Elness likes to say, you never know exactly what's going to happen, and that's true tonight. If you're paying careful attention, you've probably noticed by now that I'm neither Eric nor am I Chris Alexander. I am Scott Grissel, and I produce Darkwood Brew, which means a lot of my work is behind the scenes. This week, we're finishing up our discussion of vocadio. Vocadio is finding the work of your soul in the soul of your work. This is our last episode in the series. In fact, this session wraps up a 72-week meta-series that we call By This Way of Life. We're going to say a little bit more about that tonight. I'm really excited to be hosting tonight. Our subject is called Called to Misfit Community. As you'd probably guess, we do a lot of work up front for each Darkwood Brew episode. As we discuss this week's episode a ways back, I thought, hmm, misfit energy. Maybe Eric should be our guest this week. <laughs> Not for the reason you might think. Well, I'm pretty sure Eric will cop to being a misfit, and I'm going to ask him about that. It's because misfit community is something that Eric feels a, a particular affinity for. And it's an important concept in his upcoming book, Gifts of the Dark Wood. We'll talk more about that, too. Before we do, let's have a look at what's happened so far in this series. Are you with me? I need you to go with me. I don't think we could change what we do to create a restaurant that is one size fits all, because I think that's what makes it special. I'm a human being who has learned to love herself enough so that I can so that I can give love to other people. I think we actually find those plot twists to be deeply satisfying. Dream the dream that's for you. It's not for anybody else, it's for you. The improvisational nature was so much like the spirit of God working in us. You also love Korean food. Yes, I did. There's a yes, story about being on one of these great big fishing boats. I don't tell boats. that whole story. Oh. That'll take too long. <laughs> what makes wine magical, in your opinion? That I cannot tell you, and therefore it was magic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to be here tonight. You know, and it, it occurred to me when I was getting ready that uh, five weeks ago we did this and we sat in these chairs. Yeah. And I was a guest and you interviewed me. So <laughs> I had actually forgotten that until I saw the uh, highlights. Is that, like, oh, that's you weren't so behind right? the scenes in this series after all. Well, you were merciless, so watch out, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, before we jump in and talk about this sort of idea of misfit community and misfit energy, um, we do need to acknowledge that. We are at the end of this big meta series, which is called yeah. By This Way of Life. And I remember sitting with you and with Chris Alexander, who's here tonight in a Thai restaurant. Um, and we were talking about 72 weeks that was stretching out in front of in us. In front of us, yeah, before. And, and it seemed a little intimidating. So, t so now, looking back, it's like, wow, we did that. 
Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's gone so fast in, in so many ways, too, but it really did seem incredibly intimidating to embark. Like, what if you realize when you're like a quarter of the way into it, like, oh, this just isn't working? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But it, it was really a, an incredible way to, I think, look at uh, uh, more deeply than um, ever before at the, the way of life that Jesus is, is calling us into mm -hmm. and look at it from all kinds of different angles, really, you know, 12 different different angles, uh, and I think we came up with a lot of um, uh, things that surprised people, actually, about, uh, you know, there's kind of the path of Jesus as espoused in kind of modern American Christianity, uh, and then there's the path of Jesus as you look at it in its ancient roots, and uh, I, think, I think a lot of people were, were kind of saw quite a difference between what, what is and what the expectation is and what really is if, when you start looking at that path. And we heard from a lot of people just during the course of that series that there were, and, it, and it's funny because it, it happens at different places for different people, but there were really life-altering sort of revelations that, that they had. And so I, I know for me being a part of that, I mean, that's an, an important, um, important for me that what we're doing is actually something that's making a difference in people's lives. And, um, you know, I, I know we had uh, you know, we had a series called For the Love of God that was about mm -hmm. the Bible and homosexuality right. and what's really said there. And, and people would say, I didn't know that or I hadn't thought about things that way. We gave people some new things to think about. And I think that happened pretty much through the, um, through the entire series. Yeah, I agree. I think the big, the big revelation coming out of that series was, I mean, we were, you know, uh, weren't saying the Bible has nothing negative to say about uh, you know, uh, sexuality in, in that form. Uh, but actually, that if you're going to interpret it, that, that to say uh, that's a sin, there's uh, how we read the Bible then changes fundamentally against what most people would think. Right. It actually turns uh, our, our biblical interpretation to something that's very twisted and very um, uh, much not even what a conservative uh, interpretation would, of, of life and faith would, would be about. And the kinds of things we have to then uh, condemn in order to then hold that one was, is becomes quite extraordinary. Seems kind of out of character for this Jesus guy, doesn't it? That, that's right, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we could talk about For the Love of God for an entire episode. <laughs> and we will, but we'll oh, do that yeah. next week. Okay. So, um, so uh, we'll mention that again a little bit later in the show. Um, I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit more about that. But we are kind of, kind of a celebration, a little bit of a retrospective, but also something that will be a chance for us to look uh, towards the future, so right. I'm excited. But um, what I'd like to do right now, and what we do every week, and usually you introduce this, is um, a, pr a practice here that we call Numa Divina. Um, you'll be uh, back uh, leading meditation later in the show, and so we'll get back to this verse again and sort of approach it in a very different way. But what I'd like to have happen right now is for um, Tracy to go ahead and read uh, John 20, 1 through 16, and then we'll talk about that a little bit. Cool. From John chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, 
sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Thanks, Tracy. So kind of to get us started here, let, let's talk about that story that we just heard. Um, as it would come to us as a story about misfit community, <laughs> about people who don't quite fit in, about people who feel like the world has just tilted on its axis a little bit. Um, where, where do you find connection in, that, in this story to that kind of energy? Yeah, I, I see uh, misfit writ written all over mm -hmm. the, the uh, John's uh, gospel accounts of, of, of all of the post-resurrection uh, uh, experiences. Uh, this one, um, I think, really uh, kind of brings kind of, I would say, the trifecta of misfitism <laughs> together. Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've always felt that uh, uh, the church of the misfits, or the, really the highest expression of the Christian community is to recognize it's a church of misfits. And what I've always meant by that is that, that we're misfits, we recognize that we're misfits with respect to God's realm, in that we never live up to the ideals um, and the aspirations and the hopes and dreams that we ourselves are even proclaiming so loudly. Uh, we're automatically <laughs> hypocrites in that, in that respect. And we realize that, we, therefore, there is no grounds for self-righteousness uh, within our community and also between our community and people who are not Christian. We're also, um, though, misfit uh, in the sense that when, on those rare occasions when we actually do live into those ideals and we actually do follow, well, then we become misfits with respect to society who generally doesn't, don't recognize those, those very ideals. But in, this, in that particular text, I think there's another important kind of facet of misfitism that is related uh, but could be said a little differently. Uh, Mary is someone um, like any of the disciples who is misfit in the sense that she it is absolutely as clear as a bell. There's no, there's no shadow of doubt in her mind that without Jesus, um, there is no hope for her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, that the life really has has no no meaning to it a, at all. And she and that's what really brings her to kind of ground zero um, uh, of her faith. It's like, you know, how can we go on? And curiously enough, um, when you look at those gospel accounts in any of the gospels, the only people Jesus um, appears to are those very ones who, who are convinced that life is, has no meaning without Jesus. And you think, well, this is kind of strange, actually, because you know, if Jesus is resurrected, you think, well, why not appear to Caesar <laughs> or to Pontius sure. Pilate or to the Pharisees or Sadducees or scribes or to Herod Antipas or any of these people who were actually involved or had any way to think to do with his crucifixion or who could change the entire Roman Empire, you know, would save Christians 300 years of persecutions for starters if he would have just appeared like that. Or in the middle of Jerusalem Square, and um, you know, showing, hey, I'm here, I'm back. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but he doesn't, and and that's been a, a ground of course. I mean, course. In fact, yeah. he shows up as somebody who looks like a gardener. Yeah, that's right? a very he can be curious... mistaken for a gardener. Yes, right? that's yeah. That there's all we could go on for about an hour <laughs> about uh, that. That's a very intriguing one. I mean, suggesting that Jesus does oh, comes to us then post-resurrection as Holy Spirit, as, but we don't always recognize Him then because He's, he is a, it, it's, he's the Spirit of the living Christ. It's, uh, he is, that's His fullest identity and that also ensures that He is always with us. He's always resurrected hmm. Christ. But um, yeah, I always find it interesting too that you, know, you have Adam and Eve in the garden as gardening and then He comes back as a gardener, and hmm. kind of this, the second Adam kind of <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah, tip I too. And, and plus, I think He's just messing with her. I mean, he's so. Happy. I mean, we're we're all we're all down in the dumps and stuff like this, and, and yet, yet he's like, you know, all his pain and agony are over. It's like, hey, hey, I'm gonna, you know, you know I, I really do think uh, there's something to that. Mm. Uh, 
he, Jesus is far happier and jo more jovial, I think, than we often give him credit for. Hmm. Would you mind if I read something from your book and then just asked you to comment on it? I'm always happy to hear what I've written. I thought you might <laughs> Especially be. Especially if I don't so, have to write anymore. All right, so I'm going to do this with my glasses on. So this is, this is from your book, um, which will be coming out um, soon, called The Gifts of the Dark Wood. And um, this is from the chapter that's called The Gift of Misfits. And I want, I'm going to read you a couple kind of short paragraphs in there, and then we'll, we'll talk about what they mean to you, or you can expand on that a little bit. So you say, if, if we enter the dark wood alone and stay there alone, the odds are stacked against us that, we'll be, that we will be back at the adversary's taverns in no time, drinking and worshiping at the cult of the mediocre. I like that, the cult of the mediocre. The spirit knows this, which is why the dark wood offers another gift, one that may be the most important of all. I call this gift the community of fellow misfits. It's interesting. We'll talk about that. You may react to the word misfit reading into it more than I intend. What I mean by misfit is someone who is being as intentional as you are about embracing the gifts of the dark wood and finding their place in this world, if not more so. These are comparatively rare individuals in a world absorbed by materialism, mass market consumerism, religiotainment, and quick fixes. Yet there are more than enough of these misfits who swim against the current to find small community even in the smallest of towns. If you're not aware of them, you haven't been looking, or you've been too certain that you can't find them to send out any signals that you're interested in their company. So tell me about these misfits out there. And one of the things that you say is that we might, when we hear the word misfit, we might misinterpret to some degree what you mean by that. And, and yet, um, it still seems like a great way to describe this energy that you talk about in your book, and I know you, you talk about personally a lot too. So just tell me a little bit about who are these people? Yeah. Well, uh, really they're, they're people who uh, kind of like, like Mary, uh, they may have not speak of this in the same language, but they recognize that life is kind of, it really is hopeless under their own power and authority without, you know, they just can't make it through the dark wood uh, alone under our own power and authority. It's, it's dark in there. Life is full mm -hmm. of uncertainty and full of uh, mystery and emptiness and lostness and, and so forth. And that there's something about the soul's work in the world where we can, we can get along, you know, kind of okay, just to, we can live, we can, we can make mortgage payments as we have kids and so forth that, that will kind of do something for us. But there seems to be part of the work of our soul that is actually essential that we uh, reach a bit deeper uh, within ourselves to find uh, the voice of God uh, who is actually uh, helping us to come, that comes from outside of us and yet is deeply inside of us at the same time and is capable um, uh, and, and interested very much in guiding us. Uh, and it's a voice that loves us beyond what we can know and helps us orient our lives according to that, that discovery that we are loved. And so there, there are all kinds of people out there uh, who um, are trying to sense spirit in their life. They're trying to discern, you kind of ask, you know, uh, uh, how am I being guided? And yet not in the ways of kind of, kind of the, the mass media might uh, expect, you know, like, you know, a lot of people think, you'd think that to hear some people talk about the Holy Spirit guiding them, you'd think that, you know, the Holy Spirit told me to buy this brand of hot dog versus mm -hmm. the other and go to this parking place versus the other and so forth like that. But these people t tend to be uh, folks who um, have a sense of it's all about following the Spirit, uh, but also have a humility with respect to, to how much we can actually know about the Spirit and, and are always asking that kind of postmodern question that I I've once heard from Phyllis Tickle. It was the Holy Spirit speaking or, or the pizza I just ate. <laughs> right, right. You know, they're recognizing that we are, are uh, kind of tuned to hear or kind of respond to different influences in our lives. But there really is a God who really is active and really is able to, uh, to guide us through that, those still small voices. And so there are all kinds of, but that's, those are misfits in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the world, uh, really. And there are individuals, there are communities, there are small groups, there are communities of faith. Uh, hmm. So this, um, it, you, you talk about kind of hearing the voice of spirit and that that, um, that, that probably manifests in a lot of different ways for people or can manifest in, in different ways. Um, do you, is there, is there a sort of coherence to that as you, as you look around? I mean, do you see that um, when people seem to be tapped into this voice, these misfits, mm -hmm. that, um, 
Do they act a certain way? Can you tell by looking at them? Do they have spiked hair? What, what is it that, that helps you? Or can you and I even know these misfits? Do they have to jump out and tell us? Like, how do we know this community? They tend to be about six foot two, have dark hair, <laughs> uh, big uh, glasses, uh, wear brown jackets. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, uh, they are extremely diverse, uh, as diverse as the human race is diverse. But there does seem to be kind of a, a tenor and tone I, I pick up on people who are uh, who are constantly seeking that connection and, co and constantly, in my understand perception, connecting with that. There tends to be a, a, a quite a generosity of spirit hmm. is, is one of the ways that right. characterizes them. Uh, a whole lot of grace, and I had the feeling that that uh, people who, who do tap into this are, you know, they feel like misfits. They are misfits. They themselves feel like they're misfits with respect to God's realm. That, that that this realm is so much greater and so much bigger and so much more beyond what we can imagine. That we're always just kind of looking through a glass darkly, and so there are people who um, actually aren't are the, about the last ones to take these high horse moral stands. Uh, you know, in, at least anyone that would exalt themselves over their fellow peers. They may take st you know, strong stands for justice and, and morality in that sense, uh, but always from a, a standpoint of, uh, of, uh, of humility with res and, and, also, and, and realizing that we're all part of one kind of human family. So consequently, if you're if, uh, one of the forms of misfit, I think that's important, for instance, is a, is a mentor figure, someone who, you know, oftentimes you may, you know, point, they seem like people you might want to be when you grow up one mm. day. <laughs> They're people who have spent a little bit more time in the dark wood than, than you have, perhaps, and are used to negotiating around the, the, the pitfalls and the, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the stumbling points. And uh, they can listen. And, and one of the things that characterizes a good misfit mentor is someone who can actually listen to you without judgment. Um, they're not always asking, well, you thought that, what, you know, or <laughs> right, you did right. that, what? You know, they're actually, they're, they're taking it all in, be, and, and there's no sense that anything you're telling them um, is, is causing them to feel that way. They're not just biting their tongues, <laughs> you know? right. but actually um, they have a deep enough sense of their own um, uh, selves that they, can, they hear everything you have to say and take it in or actually listening uh, more, than, more than talking, and mm. then you come out with those you know, have you seen it this way? Have you mm. seen it that? They don't have to be tremendously wise. They have to be a bit humble mm. um, and simply offer you an outside perspective because when it comes to any of us discerning the spirit, I mean, as my wife can tell you, <laughs> uh, and anybody knows me, it's like you can't just simply expect to download you know, this and, and be totally confident you've got it all on your own. It takes community also. It takes people to bounce these things off of and, and sense your own reactions to their reactions and, and so forth. So. Mm. A, pastor, uh, a mentor of some sort is, is very important and also t in the, today's world very accessible hmm. which is interesting because you know in, in days of old people used to seek out mentors um, and they would be restricted to basically their local village because you, you know there's only so much you can so far you can go but now that we have the internet we have you know Skype connections we have telephone and all these things your mentor, um, you're not restricted to your local village anymore. You're actually the world. You can, you can actually look throughout the world and say, who would I like to be when I grow up? Or who, who kind of inspires me that way? Maybe I can connect um, uh, with them. And so consequently, for the past, uh, oh, about 20, the last 33 years, my own mentor um, and I have lived 1,800 miles away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've checked in with, with him uh, once a month by phone or by Skype. So you, you identify in the book, too, a couple other kinds of misfits. So there's, there's or members of misfit community or people who have this misfit energy. Can, can you tell me about the other two mentors being one? Yeah. Yeah, and, it's, yeah, yeah. and then, so then the, another one is, uh, would be a small group. I think that's really, that is an essential part of, 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 the, of the Christian path. I mean, look what Jesus did, I mean, with, with 12 people. <laughs> right, right. And, and I, mean, he, I mean, I don't, he wasn't a fool. I mean, he could have operated in many, many different ways uh, with many different kinds of configurations about how he would uh, work in the world. And he chose to work with a, a small group of 12. And I, I really think that that's reflecting some deep wisdom and, and possibly even, I mean, this may sound like heresy to some, but also that small group may have been the way that Jesus himself helped to discern uh, the spirits uh, use, uh, uh, 
uh, word to him. I mean, he was up all night in prayer and so forth trying to discern this. It would make perfect sense that he would also be uh, working some ideas out in community uh, with other people. But regardless, we're not, we're not Jesus, so we don't have to worry about whether Jesus kind of was able to download <laughs> that all and get it or had to use a small group too. But certainly we do. And uh, 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 a, a misfit small group are people who uh, basically are dark wood travelers like yourself. They, um, they are looking for something more to life. They're looking uh, in the Christian community, they're really people who are interested in exploring the way of life that Jesus invites us into in a more deep way. So they may be uh, gathered to uh, do Bible study together they, or uh, just simply have, have conversation. But usually that involves uh, some sort of deep conversation, just personal conversation. You know, hey, you know, what's, what's your week been like? Um, and a lot of the conversation goes around that, and there, there may be some external reason they've been called together. For instance, uh, yeah, Bible study or a Darkwood Brew uh, <laughs> DVD uh, electronic uh, study, right. things like that. And in fact, actually, that's why that was part of the, the major genesis reason for Darkwood Brew itself was recognizing the incredible importance and power of the small group to change uh, your life change the community you're in, change the world even, and so that we were looking for ways to produce small group materials that could be go on forever and ever and ever, because right, right. small groups need to go on forever and ever and ever. Uh, my own uh, pastoral mentor likes to call them disciple bands. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what really what they are, is, is people helping each other out on, on this, this difficult road. And um, like, they're kind of like if, you, if they're the, in the dark wood of life, if the, the mentor figure is the kind of the acts as an interpretive guide, you know, kind of helping you kind of see your way, interpret things, uh, the, the small group would be more like the, uh, the folks around the campfire. Mm. And then, so we have mentors and we have small groups. Who's yeah. left? The last one is the one that's most difficult to kind of wrap our heads around, I think. And I would compare them to the ale house in the dark wood, <laughs> uh, so to speak. The place Sounds where, fun. Yeah, that's I right. Like well, it can people. be fun. It can also be, you know, <laughs> if you think about it, you know, if you have a little more ale, then it can be disastrous, right. too. You know, so it kind of depends. And that's kind of how it works. Uh, the, the ale house uh, in the dark wood are really, uh, is a larger collection of people. It's the place where groups, small groups may, may gather. And uh, in, in today's expression, you, um, many of them would be churches. Um, and, uh, but the, the church community is, is also an essential piece of this because there seems to be this, um, the way that the spirit operates, it keeps wanting us to, to link us to um, a larger community uh, than even a, in, in a small group. And of course, there's a lot of trouble people have with churches these days. I mean, there's a lot of hypocrisy, there's a lot of uh, infighting and, and ego and all this, this stuff, but that's ex precisely, I think, why the Spirit wants us in the church, not so that we can transform it, <laughs> right. but actually because there is uh, no other group in the, in the world, kind of group in the world, that's actually overtly concentrated on the way of Jesus, saying, this is our ideal, this is what we're hoping for, and there you get you bring all these misfits in who you know who who are misfit with respect to God's realm, <laughs> right. right? Together, trying to be community together, and and dealing with those hard issues, those hard you know the conflicts and so forth, are the way that we cut our teeth on discovering ourselves and our identities in the world and and learning you know it's really easy to be spiritual if everybody agrees with you and 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 everybody's on the same wavelength and they all love you and, and trust you and all this um, but it's a whole lot different ball game when you're dealing with people with different ideas and different um, sensibilities and different ways of being broken mm. you know it was really transformative for me years and years ago um, when I was a young minister. I used to think, oh, I want to get the brightest and best people into my church, and, and we're going to have the brightest and best congregation. I mean, I really, I, I wasn't, didn't use quite those words, but it was, I really did have that sense. Uh, but it wasn't until I realized, no, actually, I want the broken. <laughs> uh, the more brokenness we can have reflected in our community, actually, I discovered the better it got, mm. um, that the power of the spirit in us in a community that acknowledges its brokenness that truly is broken and is yet striving for uh the word from the lord um i i would trade a hundred of those perfect communities for just one good broken church hmm. you know i know that we have a question in the coffee house and i know as always at darkwood brew our time is limited <laughs> but i do want to put you on the spot just briefly because I'm thinking that there's no way that either you or I are misfits, right? 
Do you, yeah. have you ever felt a sense of misfit energy in your own call? I know in doing this Vocadio series, we've been yeah. talking to people about their own experiences. So it, does anything come up for you where you can say, wow, I can personally identify with that? <laughs> no. Okay, no. Well, that's good. Well, let's go to our... <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, really, I could bisect that to the, the two ways that I talked about you know, to earlier, uh, misfit with respect to God's realm. You know, years ago, I made a list of everything that I'm actually happiest about in my ministry and, and has really brought me most fully alive. And it was devastating <laughs> when I realized that every single one of those things um, had something directly to do either with something I, I opposed at first, said, hell no, I'll never do it, and then had an awakening you know, and repentance <laughs> and did, did it, or was a result of some failure hmm. that then opened me to a new awareness and, and, and life in, a, in another direction, um, one of those, those two. Um, and so there is that, that, that brokenness very much. Um, I embrace that, that brokenness rather than kind of skirt it off. It, hmm. It's actually, it's helpful for me to s try to see my life as clearly as possible with a, with a clear eye and that, you know, realizing that the truth is our friend. You know? hmm. And so even if the truth hurts, it's actually uh, is our friend. And then the other way, I, th I think, you know, in terms of those rare moments when we actually do live in to um, the way God wants us to be, it makes us misfits with respect to everybody else. And I do think that there is a sense as individuals and a sense of communities where um, the, the inbreaking of the Spirit always results in something that might be called heterodoxy. Hmm. That is, uh, it, it moves the orthodoxy forward about a, a half a step. And, and when you take that half a step outside of orthodoxy, suddenly all the orthodox are, <laughs> you know, like, wait a minute, oh my God, you know, you're, 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 this, is, this is something new. <laughs> uh, and, and that puts you into a, a kind of a, a precarious position sometimes, uh, sometimes a lonely position as well. And, but what happens in the development of, of Christian faith, you can see this for 2,000 years, and you can see this in Judaism before it, is that you have the, what, the established orthodoxy, then you have the, some folks who, you know, you, and, and all of us kind of do this in our own various ways. It's not just one group of folks who do this, but they take a, they, they are guided by the Spirit into a half a step. You know, they're not rejecting all of orthodoxy. They're just simply t extending it, and orthodoxy erupts. But then that that new heterodox that heterodoxy becomes the new orthodoxy eventually, which then generates the new heterodoxy, which then generates the new orthodoxy, and that's how the the tradition goes. So there's hope in that brokenness. There's hope in that feeling of separation. It sounds like. There better be, because that's our reality. <laughs> <laughs> right. For misfits like you and me. That's right. right. So, so, um, so, Tracy, I understand we have a question from the coffee house. Um, a question or a comment? Uh, what is it? We do. Some of the discussion uh, from the coffee house is centered around both uh, the Numa Divina, Divina reading and Mary as a misfit in that. And, um, and part of the comment question that, that arose from that, why would Jesus and the angels, who are so close to God, and who would then know answers to larger questions, ask a rhetorical question like, woman, why are you weeping? Yeah, it does seem like be the, the world's dumbest <laughs> question. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> right. And since you know the mind of God, oh, why yeah, don't you yeah. tell us? More <laughs> dumb questions. No. <laughs> More dumb questions, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh, <laughs> maybe it's good we're wrapping this series up. <laughs> that's right, right, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, my personal take on that, yeah, is if it's like, it, it's so dumb, so obvious that anybody's going to say, well, what the heck? <laughs> you know? But I don't think that question is actually is, is in there for Mary's uh, benefit. It's, it's actually uh, for ours. Uh, but even looking at Mary, I think that what this kind of the mythological imagination of, of, the, of, the, of the story is trying to tell us, and by that I mean the story um, is not simply trying to describe what happened 2,000 years ago, but also... Um, the, the, the points of this, I, have, I mean, not all the stories told, and what is told is really also pointing to what always happens time and time again. And it seems that, that when we're at ground zero of our own faith, when, when we have lost all hope, the first call of the Spirit is not simply to say, oh, comfort, comfort, comfort. <laughs> it's actually to say, why are you weeping? It gets us into ourselves asking, well, what are the things I'm weeping about? Uh, uh, when I, we look at our world today, for instance, I mean, that's a good question for any of us, is why would we weep in today's world? You know, what, are, what, what causes our, us to kind of lose sense of that, of that hope? And, we, and until we can kind of get to that, we, the Spirit can't do a whole lot for us hmm. to try to, to, to solve that, you know, that, that issue. 
And, and so I think that that's, that's part of the reason is to simply throw the question back at us. You know, why, why, are, why are you weeping? Hmm. Uh, what, what, are, what are those things that are so profoundly disconnected that you really uh, can't find your way to hope without bringing some semblance of, of order or meaning, meaning to that? I mean, today I think a, a, an extremely good um, way of posing that question, I mean, looking at that is, is it, as we look at the way that t technology has democratized the instruments of mass destruction, um, uh, and the way the technology has uh, created that really the mechanisms of unchecked consumption um, of the world's resources, um, you know, the, it's surprising how many people today you know, wonder, will, are we really in kind of some of the last generations to actually, uh, on Earth, to actually mm -hmm. know life as we know it? I mean, do, do we have 100 years left, uh, 200 years before either we blow ourselves up or global warming takes over or what have you? And, and you know, the, the, the fundamentalist understandings of Christianity used to say, well, yeah, the world's coming to an end, uh, but, and we need to fear God. It's like, well, no, I, I, they may have had the sense that there is an end, but it, it's not God we need to be afraid of in that sense of wanting to end the world. It's ourselves. You know, and boy, you know, if we take that, that seriously, um, there's a lot of weeping <laughs> to be done. Why are you weeping? What? And then, but also that's, if the story is correct, when we get to that center of our weeping, that's also the exact place where the Spirit is able to meet us and do a new thing that com completely confounds our ability to understand <laughs> and completely takes us to a new place where there actually is real hope. Hmm. You know, um, before we take a, a, a little break and then come back and do some business, one thing that just occurs to me as we're talking that seems like it's worth saying is that, and, it, and it's interesting that we are at the end of this meta-series, that, this, that these people in misfit community uh, seem to me to be relating to um, what Jesus might have put out there as those three loves of God, of love of God, love of neighbor, and love of self, and using those as sort of the compass heading. Yeah, there is a, a very um, interesting correspondence across uh, faith traditions, um, uh, you know, denominations, and so forth. There seems to be, um, uh, when I look out at the world and see kind of the communities of faith that that are most vibrant, most excited, most uh, generous spirited, uh, most happy, um, even in their brokenness. Um, they tend to be communities that, that take that basic thing that Jesus said, you know, when, when he was asked what's the most important commandment, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. There are actually, um, you know, there's three great loves there. We often think of them as two. I mean, love God and neighbor, but Jesus says love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and, and so there's the self that needs to be taken seriously too, not being uh, self-centered uh, in that sense, but actually uh, recognizing that God has created you with a distinct identity and a beauty um, and that needs to be taken seriously because you are part of God's creation. You need to treat yourself with as much dignity as you treat the bush mm -hmm. <laughs> and the tree and the forest and so forth. Um, but these communities that seem to be uh, kind of spinning in a similar vibe uh, right now tend to be the ones who, who take all three of those loves together and say they must go together in any of our actions. That you can't settle, settle for two out of three ain't bad. So like I'll love God and myself, but not my, I'm going to care less about my neighbor. Or I'll love God and my neighbor, but care less about myself. Or I'll love my neighbor and myself and forget God <laughs> in the equation. Right. That all three need to come together, that any organic community that's actually following the Spirit tends to, you can look at their actions and all three um, uh, are, are the focus of that love. Hmm. Well, thanks for giving us a really different way to think about misfits now. I think when I hear that word, I'm going to take it in with some real different sort of connotations to it. Well, so. my, my pleasure. And, uh, you know, whenever I think of misfit, I'll always thought of you. So. <laughs> You're not the only person. <laughs> so. um, you know, let's listen to a little bit of music, and when we come back, we'll do a little bit of business, and I think after that, there's going to be some meditation happening. Sounds good.
right, guys. Thank you. So um, we had uh, Bob Ravenscroft and the Inner Journeys Trio on the show, part of Vocadio, yeah. um, three weeks ago, I think yeah, that I think was. So, yeah. And they're going to be here at Countryside. Uh, yeah. Coming up soon. Tell, and, tell us about that. And we'll be streaming them over the Darkwood Brew uh, site. Yeah, during uh, Lent, we were uh, engaging in a series of, of uh, ex uh, kind of a season of exploration of different ways to do meditation, especially for those who have a hard time doing meditation. And we used some music that was uh, about the last you'd ever associate with meditation. Mm. But actually, it ended up turning all kinds of people on to uh, to meditation itself. Um, and that was music supplied by the, the Inner Journeys Trio. We had a tremendous time with that during Lent, and we're, we are actually going to be joined with them uh, live in, in, the, in the sanctuary of Countryside Church, and we'll be streaming that out to the community. So if you missed Spirit Lab, or if you were part of it and want some more, uh, we'll be, we'll be uh, offering their music and some meditations uh, on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central and 8 p.m. Eastern. And how would you characterize their music? I mean, it's really different. Some people might not even approach it musically to begin with in, yeah. in just the way that they take it in. So what, what if somebody hasn't seen sure. them on Darkwood Brew, tell me good, a little bit about what that's question. like. Well, its root form is jazz, okay. um, but it's, it's really its expression from that root is highly improvisational music. Uh, some uh, have called, you would call it avant-garde or free jazz. So mm. it's, it's a lot of, uh, it's really like, like a bunch of, uh, like three musicians having a really deep and involved conversation mm. with each other, uh, but not using any kind of musical score that has been written out in advance. And so one advances a thought and the other says, oh, that's interesting, I'll pick up this. You know, it, it's like that, except they have instruments where they're mm. doing it. It's, it's really fascinating. I, it blows my mind. I can't understand how the mind must work to be able to do that. But it's, um, it, to me, their music has always been kind of, you can't predict where it's going, where, where, it's, <laughs> where it's coming from. It's kind of sometimes even seems chaotic. Mm. But there's this deep stillness right in the heart of it, uh, this, this stillness, this center to it that has always, for years now, has helped me in my own meditation. So you have this wild music going on, but you're feeling actually, you're sensing mm. that stillness within yourself, which is where oftentimes I think the spirit speaks with its clearest voice. Mm. Well, I hope you'll forgive me for the next thing I'm going to bring up, but we have a four-part series <laughs> after next week on... Oh, that was bad. Forgiveness! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, four, four, four episodes on forgiveness. You'd think that we could just cover it in one, right? Forgive right. and forget. That's right. it, right? <laughs> no, that's a... Or two, forgive, forget. Oh, that's true, yeah. yeah. There you go. yeah. Except that's the exact wrong uh, way to forgive. That, that has nothing to do with... Forgiveness has nothing to do with forgetting in, in, that, in that sense. That's one of the most misunderstood concepts within Christendom is the concept of, of forgiveness. So somebody does somebody wrong, and then you say, well, we're, I'm Christian, I must forget that, right? Um, actually, no, there are times where you're not supposed to forget that, actually. And there are ways of, of where forgiveness, if you, if you walk the path correctly, um, it, it then resets the relationship to a complete zero point, like as if it never happened. So mm -hmm. there is a f deep forgetting, but only after some things have happened. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be exploring those things that, that way. But Jesus says, you know, if, if somebody wrongs you, you need to forgive them, what, 70 times, seven times. Mm -hmm. But he also says, if you, uh, he, you know, unless there is repentance, otherwise there is no, no reason for forgiveness. In fact, you're not supposed to. Uh, and they're like, wait a minute, that sounds kind of harsh. Well, no, it's actually about the most loving thing we can do. We'll be exploring those, those kinds of things, those, those tough edges. Wow. So uh, there are a lot of ways that people can support Darkwood Brew as we move into the future, as we move out of this 72-week series as we look at what we're going to be doing and some of the exciting stuff that we have coming down the road. Can you, what are some ways that people can make, can help us make that happen? Yeah, well one, one way is we've just set up a new program that the, that the more you donate, the, the greater forgiveness you'll receive. So <laughs> that's, uh... <laughs> I think I need to give a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I was going to suggest yeah. an amount for you. Uh, <laughs> it's higher by the moment. Uh, uh, no, but but we seriously we do uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, it t takes uh, it takes money to to put us on the air. This is not uh, funded by Countryside Community Church, even though it's streaming out. It's stream it is funded by you, uh, the viewers, and so uh, we we really appreciate your support. It means a lot to us, and it very keeps us coming so. coming coming to you. That's that is a, a primary way you can help us out. Uh, another way you can help us out this week is we'd love to hear from you on the Facebook page. Uh, if you have uh, if there are ways that this the last two years of series, or any way that Darkwood Brew has touched your life, uh, any kind of uh, insights, aha moments, awakenings, or actions even that spurred 
We'd love to hear from you because we'd like to, to feature some of those comments uh, next week on the program. Great. Well, we're going to go to um, Steve Gomez, and, and he's going to introduce the Bruce Brothers here shortly. One thing I want to do when we come back, um, I'm handing the reins back over to you, um, and we're going to be, yeah, there you go, and we're going to be um, in the meditative portion of the show. So what are some things that if people are watching at home that they can do to get ready for that part of the show? Uh, good, good question. Uh, yeah, uh, if you're at, at home watching this, whether it's on the recorded version or live, um, we encourage you to kind of bring your computer to a, a quieter place, perhaps, if you're able to, if you have a laptop, put in some earbuds, perhaps, uh, although we uh, we'll just kind of want to get to a place where we're actually, uh, one of the, the things we do here is really trying to connect with the Holy Spirit. And so we need to kind of clear out as much of the, 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 the noise around us as, as possible. We also invite you to uh, collect communion elements. If you'd like to join us, we always uh, culminate our program with, uh, with the sharing of communion uh, here in the coffee house and also across the world. So if you have bread and wine or juice and crackers or something you'd like to, to come and bring to the table uh, and enjoy with us, uh, we invite you to get that also during our, the break. Mm. Well, before we clear out the noise, maybe we should make some. Make some, absolutely. So, so Steve, why don't you um, tell us who's here with the Bruce Brothers, and we've got a special vocalist tonight, don't we? That is correct. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Matt Mendes on piano, Carlos Figueroa on drums, Jorge Nila on saxophone, and of course, Miss Carol Rogers on vocals. And she's going to be singing Jesus Shall Reign and then Ferris Lord Jesus. Thank you. shall reign where the sun does this excessive journey run his kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and
Comparable Carol Rogers 